the principle of indifference made me, it's again, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm petty fogging, I'm being I'm carping on, on Bob Lazar, but of all of what he said made me you the think, most doubtful. The you most think doubtful. there's a psychological impact of a statement like that, meaning that could be a Freudian slip, if you will, of they could be doing it in a way to try to see, let's see what they're willing to believe or not. If, if people aren't actually witnessing something and there's only a select few who do. So for example, maybe let's crash in a, in, or let's land in a, in a very nondescript field back in, in Zimbabwe by this school where there's a bunch of seven-year-olds back there and we'll make sure only the seven-year-olds see us. And then it'll be this big story, but people will be like, wait, did the seven-year-old, did these seven-year-olds really, six-year-olds really just see like aliens, you know, floating around on logs in 1994 in the Zimbabwe incident, or did they not? And and therefore, maybe the aliens are trying to look at how society responds to such a claim. You understand? You think that's possible? Yes. Possible, yeah. And then, well, would it just be one alien civilization, or would it be multiple would they have some collusion? Like, okay, we stay off of Earth. Are they in competition with one another? Do they have one that is the the superordinate alien civilization that says, hey, we get to perform the tests and you don't? I don't know. Yeah. But much of what people say is just, hey, here's how aliens operate. I think that's not how it is. It can't be that. So, for instance, people say that they're following cars to intimidate cars. It could also be that they follow cars because, for whatever reason, that's their locking mechanism. That in order to then shoot off, much like you need in Sonic, the video game Sonic, you need some head start, mm -hmm. and then you just then you start to roll faster. It could be for whatever reason. However, they operate at some locking mechanism, and then they go away. And we think, oh my gosh, they're following us to give me a message. No, no, they just needed something moving so that they can. That's right. Yes, they can lock onto it. Another one is. Is you mentioned that Egypt could have been advanced and ancient Greece could have been advanced and there was some some orrery, a way of measuring the stars, the celestial objects in the sky that was advanced, that almost like a like a almost like a watch had many gears and pulleys and so on inside it. Way before it's uh, way ahead of its time. Yet they died. And so it seems like advancement, technological advancement isn't sufficient. So mm. that's why I'm saying I, I push back on when it, firstly, it's ill-defined anyone who says that they're advanced. And then secondly, even if they are advanced, w what difference does that make? We've had many examples of civilization that were su supposedly much more advanced, even the, well, Greeks and, and ancient Egyptians, and I'm sure there's more who just perished. So technological advancement isn't sufficient. But yes, it's possible. Now, something about Bob Lazar that he said that I just disagreed with, and it made me question him. And it's so petty. It's so petty. It's, he said, this comes from hearsay because Jeremy Corbell said it, so it's like two levels removed. Yeah. Technically speaking, in the law, that's hearsay. He said, oh, gosh, firstly, when someone predicts that there's a new element, that's, no one predicts, you don't predict that there's a new element. It's obvious that there's going to be an element after a certain... You can just count the numbers like we were doing before. One, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight. So I can tell you right now, Kurt's prediction, there's an element 257. 100 years from now, there's going to be some element. Sure, it's I going understand. to be short-lived. And they're going to be like, oh my gosh, Kurt predicted that? <laughs> no. Okay. You heard it here first exactly. on JDP, baby. So firstly, that I don't think... Bob Lazar predicted the existence of a different element. And then even when Jeremy Corbell said, look, you were right. You predicted it. He said, ah, well, 50-50, I could have been correct, could have been wrong. And I was thinking, man, so there are four different interpretations of probability. And again, this is petty and persnickety. But one is classical, where you look at a coin, you're like, I don't know if it's biased. I'm going to say it's heads or tails, so it's 50-50. I'm going to say there are two options, so it's 50-50. That's called the principle of indifference. I don't know the difference between these guys. I'm going to assign them the same probability. Then there's the frequentist where you just watch something happen many times. This is why I also don't believe it's necessary that there's life in, on the outside of Earth, nor is it unnecessary because we only have a one case. You can't generalize from N equals one. Oh. You have no idea. Okay, so that's a frequentist interpretation. Then there's the subjective Bayesian where you just assign some probability. 
and it has a reference class problem that I brought up to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Here's just for fun, if people are interested. If you were to say that, if I was to ask you, what are the, what are the odds that you're going to die tomorrow? You could say, well, I'm a white male. I'm 30-ish. I don't smoke. I drink. Okay. But then you could also add that you're from a certain neighborhood, that you're fr- like, there are many factors you oh, can yeah. add. So what is, what you want to say is, I am one of some example. I am this guy. And then I have to put something in the denominator in order to get the probability. I have to put something over here. And so you want to say, I'm some representative of this class. But then you have a you have problem choosing this class. Oh, yeah. So when I was talking to Neil deGrasse Tyson, he was putting odds. I'm like, you have a reference class problem. How do you know the reference class is correct? Because I could also say, look, the other the reference class is you're an element of all living creatures. The majority of living creatures will die tomorrow because the majority of them are bacteria who only live for, let's say, 10 hours. So if I was to pull you out of a hat, you're most likely going to die in the next 10 hours. That's a valid statement. But it's we think of that, no, that's absolutely incorrect because you chose a, a poor reference class. Then the issue is you're like, well, let me add more and more factors. Well, if you add more and more factors, you get less and less data and the probability becomes unreliable to the point where you just only have you in the denom- denominator. So it's called the reference class problem. Right. And then there's the metaphysical interpretation of probability, which is which almost no one believes except I think it may have some credence, but people don't like to believe it. You went where I was going to ask. So yeah, that makes sense. That there is something inherent in the world that has some probabilities. Okay. So the reason why I didn't like what Bob Lazar said is he chose, he said, oh, it was 50-50 that this element could have been there or could not have been. I'm like, how do you, how do you assign a probability 50-50 to a yes-no just because it's a yes and no? So an example is that Look, there are three cases when you flip a coin. It's heads, tails, but it could also go on his edge. Are you telling me, a priori, you're going to assign one-third to all those probabilities? Mm. So the principle of indifference made me... It's, again, like I mentioned, I'm I'm pettifogging. I'm being carp, I'm carping on, on Bob Lazar, but that of all of what he said made me... You the think, most doubtful. The you most think doubtful. there's a psychological impact of a statement like that, meaning that could be a Freudian slip, if you will, of the way that he thinks about everything else because he would say something like that. No, I'm I'm mainly just playing around, but I just was like, how could you be so how could you make a statement like that? Unless you were just humoring Jeremy Corbell, because it was an offhand conversation, but I'm like, oh that just irked me. Mm, I understand. What, I mean, what do you think of him, though? Minus, my, put that aside for a second. Put obviously, like that's something that irks you. But like when you hear a guy come out with a story that you know he's certain he saw what he saw. He he had access to this deep government shit, and he's certain he did. And therefore, it's like yes, there. Not only are they they here, but we're in possession of them and their technology in some cases as well. I don't like to give opinions on people that I haven't spoken to. And then also, even when I have spoken to them, I, I'm not a fan of giving opinions. I just don't feel like that's right. I feel like that's, if they're not here, that's like taking a knife to them. I, they, I appreciate that. I know that's, if I was interviewing someone, I'm also a podcaster for people who don't know a channel called Theories of Ever- of Everything, if you're interested in looking it up. Link in description. That, one of the, remember when you first reached out to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, Julian, I don't even know if I can be interviewed because I just say I don't know to almost every question. <laughs> like, I just don't know. And it's going to be, it's going to be arid. It's going to be just no. a boring podcast, a tedious podcast. This has not been in any no, way no, no. boring. Well, I have not, I've only said I don't know two or three times. Yeah. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.